Good evening and welcome to the final session of our spring program of Tuesday Night Learning. Language is something we often take for granted, but language is more than mere communication. Within language, lie concealed magic forces and echoes of history, heritage, and culture. Language matters. Take the example of Ataturk, who following defeat in World War I, instituted radical reform in Turkey that some attribute to its being saved from territorial extinction. In converting the country to a secular state, it is astounding how in 1928, overnight, Ataturk replaced the Arabic script of the Turkish language to the Latin alphabet. In 1897, the first Zionist Congress in Basel was far more brazen and ambitious. Its raison d'etre was, of course, the Herculean objective of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine. The chutzpah and sheer gutsiness of the Zionist project cannot be overstated. But while audacious, the creation of a state is not without precedent. What is unprecedented, however, is the Zionist Congress's determination to revive the ancient language of Hebrew as the language of the new state. The feat of, revi of reviving an ancient tongue had never occurred in the history of any nation. Philologists the world over dismissed its prospect out of hand. While Hebrew, the language of the Bible, remained the language of Jewish study and prayer, it was, in terms of daily intercourse, a dead language. Yet the Zionists insisted on the exclusive use of Hebrew in the state to be, just as there could be no compromise on settling on any, any territory other than Eretz Israel, there could be no compromise on any language other than Hebrew. The revival of Hebrew into a living, breathing tongue is as miraculous as the creation of the state itself. At long last, this brings me to this evening's talk. In 1939, more than 12 million people spoke Yiddish. Now it's Yiddish that is near, near extinction. In the nascent state of Israel, there was a language war against Yiddish, as only Hebrew was the language that would belong to all of the Jewish people, an expression of peoplehood. In the diaspora, Yiddish came to be regarded as the language of immigrants, people from the old country. It didn't take long for Yiddish to fall into disuse. I personally regret that I was a big loser here. My father's mother tongue was Yiddish, and that was the language in which he spoke to his parents, my Bubby and Zeta, who, despite arriving in Canada from Russia in their early 20s, only spoke halting and broken English. And because my mother's family came from Hungary, no Yiddish was spoken in my household. I wish I had been able to attend Yiddish theater or understand Yiddish humor. Yiddish is so rich in cadence, idioms and expressions, so vibrant, poignant and evocative. For me and younger generations, the language is, an, is nostalgic and depicts a bygone era. I recently discovered with delight Chava Rosenfarb's Confessions of a Yiddish Writer. It's a gem of a book, really wondrous. I urge you to go out and buy her daughter Goldie Morgenthaler's loving translation available at Bibliophile. I have been looking forward to this talk for over one year. It is my privilege to call upon Anna Gonchar, Professor of Yiddish Studies at McGill, to introduce tonight's speakers. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start, first of all, by thanking Alan Adler for suggesting the program. And so eloquently in his talk on A.M. Klein, stressed the importance and recognition of the writers, poets, and artists, and cultural activists, um, journalists, editors, who lived in our city and nurtured our hearts and minds and souls from early on, and earned from Montreal the assignation of Yerushalayim de Canada. So Alan, thank you. Louis, Thank you for following through and making this program happening, happen and for giving me the honor to be part of this evening and share it with three other women, all of us friends, Goldie Morgenthaler, Elaine Kalman-Naves and Chava Rosenbaum, 
who continues to be a powerful presence in the world of Yiddish literature and its translations. Chava was a family friend, beginning with our long connection to the Jewish Labor Bund. She was my husband's Yiddish teacher in the Abdelin Afternoon School, and their fondness for each other remained throughout her life. Chava was a writer and a poet whom I admired and respected, and with whom I had the privilege of making a short film about her life as a writer. This is it. It's called Chava Rosenfarb, The Bubble of Being. And this film about her life as a writer, which began as a young girl in Lodz, Poland. And then I was given the last honor of eulogizing her. But you're not here to listen to me. So let me introduce the two women who will bring you into the profound and challenging and tender world of Chazer Rosenfeld's writing. Elaine Kalman Naves is known to many Montrealers, to most English speaking Montrealers and, and readers of the Gazette, um, sorry, as an author of eight books, among them two award winning memoirs about her family. And she was also the longtime literary critic for the Montreal Gazette. She was also a frequent contributor to the CBC program Ideas. It was in these capacities that Elaine first crossed paths with Chava Rosenfeld and soon forged a lasting friendship. She subsequently created the script and provided the narration for the two hour documentary on ideas called Chava Rosenfeld, The Tree of Life, The Story of Chava Rosenfeld. Elaine continues to write and give talks. Goldie Morgenthaler, is professor of English at the University of Lethbridge, Alberta, where she teaches 19th century British and American literature, as well as modern Jewish literatures. She is the translator of much of Chava Rosenfeld's work, including her seminal Holocaust novel, The Tree of Life, a trilogy of life in the Lodz ghetto. Her translation career, working alongside her mother, began at the age of 13, Goldie's translation of Rosenfeld's, Rosenfeld's book of short stories, Survivors, Seven Short Stories, won a Canadian Jewish Book Award and the Modern Language Association Memorial Prize in Yiddish Studies. She's also the editor of Exile at Last, Selected Poems of Chava Rosenfeld, as well as most recently, the editor and one of the translators of a collection of Chava Rosenfeld's essays Confessions of a Yiddish Writer and Other Essays. And this is the book. This collection was a 2019 Canadian Literature Award winner and a 2020 J.I. Siegel Award winner. In addition, she has translated several stories by the great I.L. Peretz and is the author of a book on Charles Dickens and heredity and of numerous articles on Victorian literature, including one on the translation of Dickens into Yiddish. But that's not why she's here. Tonight, you will hear her and Elaine together bring us once again Chav Rosenfeld to life. Thank you. Hi, Goldie. Hi. Can nice you, to see you. Can you hear me? New Year's. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Anna, uh, for the lovely introduction and uh, to the Shar for having invited me here to speak with Goldie tonight. And let me say at the outset how happy and how delighted I am that this tribute to you and to your mother is taking place, Goldie. Um, I loved, indeed, I, I revered Hava. She was a great friend of mine, um, a mentor, a role model. Uh, I first met her uh, as um, in the capacity of uh, a journalist from the Montreal Gazette. I did a series of uh, articles back in 1994 about 
uh, immigrant writers of Montreal. And I landed very early on in this um, in this capacity um, at, at Hava's doorstep. And the, the, the link, so sorry. So sorry. Uh, the the there was an an, an instant um, a rapport between us. Uh, she she was so warm. She was such a delightful delightful person. She welcomed me to her home. She began to um, almost interview me. Uh, there was just such a quality of magnetism about her. Every word that I ever heard from Go, uh, from Hava, whether it was about the Shoah, whether it was about uh, literature, whether it was about her take on my life, was pure gold. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. And so I'm so happy that we're here to talk about her and her work and to honor you, Goldie, because all along, you've been so instrumental in bringing that work of hers, that wonderful writing of hers, to English English language readers. So, um, as as um, Anna mentioned a minute ago, you've been doing this job from the age of thirteen on, which I think is a very young age to start interviewing. Can you tell us about that? I'm sorry, not interviewing, but translating. I'm <laughs> just. Yeah, um, when I was uh, 12 or 13, I had a, an operation on my back that left me bedridden for quite a, quite a long time, for several weeks. And my mother decided she was going to take advantage of the fact that I was bored. It was the days before computers and ways to distract yourself. And there's only so much television you can watch as a 13 year old and books you can read. So she decided, she brought, came into my room one day and said, let's translate my play. And, and I, um, I thought, well, what the hell? Yes, okay. And, and I did. We, we did, we worked on it together. Uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't the best translation, as you can imagine. First of all, I was 13 years old, more or less. And also English really wasn't my first language. And I was still trying to um, to master it in a sense. So uh, it was a very that I, I did the translation. I, I don't know what happened to it. One thing I do remember is that for some reason, when I was a child, I thought I, you know, I, I heard Canadian English all around me, and everyone said A. And so I had all these, the, the play is about an uprising in the Vilna ghetto. And I had all these partisans. <laughs> adding A to whatever they said, like, <laughs> let's get the weapons, bit <laughs> word, um, it, it was that kind of, uh, it was a child's translation. And I think my mother also um, had more faith in my English ability at that time than was actually warranted. So that was how, that was really the first time I translated anything of hers. Uh, she actually did groom me. She wanted me to translate all the time whatever she wrote, um, I was not very willing. I, I, especially as I was getting older and I was an adolescent and I was um, a young adult. First of all, I had thoughts of being a writer myself, so I didn't want to work on anyone else's work. And I, um, I, I just wasn't interested. I, my mother wrote about Holocaust and she wrote about Eastern Europe and I knew nothing about it. It felt very alien to me. So um, I didn't do uh, any translating for her until the mid 1980s, by which time I was in my mid thirties. And uh, she got a contract to translate the Tree of Life uh, into English because it was gonna be published in Australia. And she'd been bugging me for years to help her with it. And when I said no, she would turn to all my friends. She would turn to anyone who she thought knew English. So, but at this time um, she, she begged me and I really, at this point I was older and I couldn't say no. And so we worked on the tree of life together. And that was really when I became more um, invested in being her translator. So I have um, in, 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 in the book, in this wonderful book of yours, um, uh, or 
of hers and yours. Uh, she writes in one essay called uh, A Yiddish Writer Reflects on Translation. Uh, she writes in it following, um, uh, reflecting the experience of getting you into really the role of translator. She says this, as time went on and my daughter grew older, I believe she realized that translation was for me a lifeline, that without her expertise in English, my future as a writer was doomed. And as she matured, my, 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 my daughter started to take her role as my translator more seriously. Working together on the translation of my books forged a bond between us that is stronger than the bond I have with any other human being, because it is made up of the intimacy that only translation can confer on a writer and her translator, and because it implies a shared creative effort. And this is quite an extraordinary statement, isn't it? It's true. <laughs> so can you comment about what it was like for you to inhabit your mother's mind and heart uh, in this extraordinarily intimate way? It's very unusual. I, I don't think I would say that I inhabited her mind. And I would, I certainly, I inhabited her heart only to the extent that I think she loved me and I loved her. Um, but I, I, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say I, in, I inhabit the writer's mind when I translate, but uh, what I, uh, I liked working with her and, and it changed my relationship to her. I mean, we were mother and daughter and we became, um, co-workers on the, on, what, on the same enterprise. And uh, that, that um, changed the way I looked at her. And I must also say that I had never realized until I, I worked on the Tree of Life with my mother, what an extraordinary writer she was. I mean, I had just, um, I had basically dismissed her as, you know, my, my father was not very complimentary about her writing. And I assumed he was right. Uh, and um, so when we, we got into the Tree of Life, and I'm dealing with this huge project that basically throws you into the atmosphere of the Lodge Ghetto, um, I, I, I was blown away. I mean, I, I, you know, I could use all kinds of cliches. I really, really was impressed. And it was really that experience that um, made me realize what an important uh, writer she was. And in a sense, it, it's given me a mission that I, I'm still on, which is to let more people know that about her writing because she was hardly known. You know, we, uh, partly because she was writing in Yiddish. So she was definitely known in Yiddish language circles for sure. But, but in English, who'd ever heard of her? So this is uh, bringing me to my my next point. I'd like to talk about the tree of life a little bit uh, a little bit further on in the interview. But she 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 um, somewhere in the book she refers to Yiddish as being the Cinderella of languages. I wonder if you could expound. I could elaborate on that. Well, I think that's right. I mean, you know, the Cinderella, the poor um, the poor girl who's who's um, completely ignored and sits in the ashes um, and uh, is waiting for a prince to marry her and, and bring her into her full birthright. I mean, I think Yiddish from the begin from its the beginnings of its history was a language that Jews called it jargon. You know, it was it it didn't even have respect among its speakers. And then uh, that changed, I think, in the late 19th century when you started to get the classical Yiddish writers and, and uh, the literature became much more widely read and, and respected. But on the whole, I, I think uh, when Jews came to America, the first thing they wanted to do is drop Yiddish and speak English, right? It, it was, uh, they were ashamed of their accents, ashamed of speaking the language. And then, as I think um, Lewis mentioned before, you got to Israel, establish a Jewish state. And the first thing the Jewish state does is it turns on one of its own languages. 
and refuses to allow people to speak it and persecutes people who, um, who, who speak it. I and mean, there were riots in Israel against Yiddish. So it, it's, um, it's a kind of, this, uh, it's been a despised language for most of its history. Um, and, it, it, and then uh, you have the blow of the Holocaust and the fact that uh, so many of the people who perished were Yiddish speakers so that the, your, your whole uh, potential readership was wiped out very, very quickly. And the, uh, those who remained and scattered to, um, to English speaking countries or, um, or Israel, for the most part, I'm not sure they passed on Yiddish to their children. Um, so even in Montreal, where, where the atmosphere, the attitude towards Yiddish was actually much different and much more welcoming and uh, nourishing, um, I think you still had something similar where each succeeding generation spoke less and less. And so in, in that sense, it has been the poor child um, of, of languages. And yet it is a very, very rich language, isn't it? A very rich language, yes. But, but I wonder if you can say- if you I can also, say yes. I was just gonna say- No, I no, I was gonna say that, that I- Any language. So a part of a part of what you said was was cut out over here, but I I think that you can say that about any. You're saying that that every language has its own has its has its richness, you know. So I I also feel impoverished in the way that Louis spoke because uh, my ancestors obviously must have spoken Yiddish, but they were Hungarians and 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 uh, the part of Hungary that I came that my family came from it was it was abandoned, although my grandparents certainly spoke it. Um, um, but when, uh, so the issue for, when we're talking about Hava is Hava, Hava knew many languages uh, and, and over time she became very, very acclimatized to English and, and spoke a beautiful English and, uh, and was able to, at one point later in her life, do her own translation. She translated two of her, her, her later novels, Bocciani and Of Lodge and Love, into, into Yiddish herself and won uh, translation prizes for it. But yet she did not, as far as I know, ever really write directly into English. And, and she, um, she said, she described English, uh, she described Yiddish at one point, Yiddish is my own language, as near to me as the skin on my body. Can you tell us a little bit about your mother's early life and how that life became so wedded to Yiddish? Well, she was born in Poland, um, in Lodz, and she was the daughter of a Bundes. And the Bund was the, um, the left-leaning uh, socialist movement among Jews in Poland, um, which had a huge following, especially between the two world wars. Um, in fact, my father's father was a city councilor for, uh, for the, uh, the Bundes party. And the thing about the Bund that um, made a difference was culturally, it was Yiddishist, right? It privileged Yiddish as the language of the masses. It established uh, schools in which Yiddish was the language of instruction. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I think Anna mentioned that I, I um, wrote an article about translations of Dickens into Yiddish. Well, they were made for the Yiddish schools in Poland and they were taught. My mother first read Dickens in Yiddish. So um, it, it, the um, Yiddish had, I think, for Bundes and arguably still for their descendants, a, a meaning that uh, transcended the, the fact that it was just a, a language to communicate with. Um, I, I think they were very aware of, of its, its importance to them and also its literary importance. So um, my mother uh, certainly grew up in a milieu that, that privileged Yiddish. She went to school in a, in a similar milieu and, it, and the language 
it was her first language and she felt uh, that it was the language she felt more at ease, most at ease in. And when you're writing, I think that matters. Right? You can have um, a fluency in other languages, but it, it, you, if you want to really express yourself, you need the language that is at the, uh, the tip of your fingers, that, that is uh, like the instrument you can pick up and play with. And that's not always easy in a language that you learn uh, as an adult. So um, I think that that was part of um, what, why Yiddish meant so much to her and start to mean even more to her when it began, when it became obvious that it was sinking in the world. And the, the kind of, uh, she had a terrible blow when the, uh, the there's a, um, a prestigious Yiddish literary journal called The Golden Kite that was the editor was Avram Sutzkever, the great uh, Yiddish poet. And once uh, it, it went under, right, it stopped publishing. And that was, she went into a depression for, for weeks and months because um, it, it, I think the message to her was, um, nobody's interested in your writing and you have nowhere to publish it, right? So it, it was, um, it, it, it mattered, but she did write in English. She has uh, one story that's written directly into English. What, what happened basically is she realized that if she didn't write in English, um, she wouldn't be read at all. And, and so painful though it was, so, so she would write into English, she would translate some of her own uh, essays and give it to me to sort of fix, you know, Goldie fix this. And, um, but, that, but she was the major translate, uh, translator of, uh, especially of one or two of the essays in uh, Confessions. Yes, I, I, I will, uh, I think I get around to one, one of those, but uh, it occurs to me that she had this incredible pride in Yiddish from a very young age because there's an incident that uh, suddenly is is coming to the fore for me, uh, and I think it may be uh, even uh, uh, fictionalized in the Tree of Life, where she was asked in high school because she attended a Yiddish elementary school, but she attended a, a Polish high school, a Polish language high school. The students were, were were Jews, and she was asked by the everybody was asked by the teacher who was their favorite author. Goldie, take over. The the story well I, I i think she says parrots or I forget yes she said, she said she said she she gets up and says you know everybody's saying i don't know shakespeare or whatever and she and what happened to her was she got she got real hell for it from the teacher how can how can you say uh, you know, how can you how can you mention this writer in the same breath exactly and the irony of course is that the teacher is jewish herself She's just a very assimilated uh, Polish Jew. Um, so yes, I, I have a strong suspicion that that actually happened. No, no, I think she told me that. I mean, I, I, th I think she actually, um, in, in my documentary, it, 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 it did happen. And I think it appears in, in, the, in the Tree of Life as well. Um, so, um, so, so um, yes, yeah, so this is a book of essays that you've gathered together, but in the main, Hava's reputation rests on her fiction, on 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 drama. That play that you originally uh, translated was just mounted uh, online on on uh, last week on in a, by um, a New York uh, drama uh, company, uh, and and so she wrote several plays. Her first book that was published was a book of poetry. Um, so this, these were the, the, the pillars of her on which her reputation uh, rested, uh, uh, novels, poems, drama. Um, but she also uh, wrote many articles, literary articles, travelogues, um, and she gave, she was, a, she was an absolutely brilliant speaker. She lectured widely, and those, you have brought all this together in this book, um, Confessions, Confessions of a, a Yiddish Writer, and I just have to uh, echo Lewis and say that this is one terrific book, and that uh, it may, I heard that it's available on, on Bibliophile. You had said to me something about it being on sale somewhere. Yes, um, 
I, I was hope I, I don't have the code. McGill Queens is offering a 20% discount on the book. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I gave the code to somebody, but I guess it didn't get transmitted. But it, uh, you need a code, but it's for listeners of this of this program, and it'll be available till the end of August. Okay, so I uh, um, readers be uh, be alerted to this fact. It's really a very 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 fine book. Um, so the the book uh, takes the title "The Confessions of a Yiddish Writer." from um, a signature lecture of, of Hava's uh, of the same title. Um, she said she gave the lecture this title because after all, what is writing if not a form of confession in disguise? No matter what the subject, all literary roads lead back to the self. So Hava was an autobiographical writer, but she never wrote an autobiography. Uh, can you talk about the difference? Uh, um, what you know, writing from your own life, but making a work of uh, the imagination from it. Talk to us about that. Well, I actually, um, when we were working on the Tree of Life, I would ask her, you know, did this really happen? Is this really based on someone? And she hated the question. She she really she didn't want to answer. Sometimes she said she told me, and it depended on her mood. But um, later on, when she was quite quite elderly already, I started to nag her to write an autobiography. Yeah, I really I really wanted to know like what is fiction and what is nonfiction. And she actually started. She started. She wrote about ten pages, and finally she said to me, "I can't write this way." My life is in my books. If you want to know what my life is like, read my books. And I, I think um, that, that, that that's true. It's, she's not um, an autobiographical a writer in the sense that she doesn't create other characters. On the contrary, uh, the tree of life is full of uh, people whom she would have, dis she liked to write about characters she would have despised and try to get in inside their heads. But I think it is true that mostly she's basing her fiction on um, on her own life, and in a, I think that's also what she means by uh, writing is confessions, right? Is uh, confession in disguise, because uh, I think she could not write about herself when it was clear she was writing about herself, but um, but when, but she could fictionalize, and that that mattered, and I think there are. <clears throat> writers, especially people who are novelists, who are born novelists, who have a hard time um, writing about themselves. I'm thinking here of my, my other passion, Dickens. He's, he also started to write an autobiography and he couldn't do it. He had to um, sort of uh, subsume it into a novel, David Copperfield. Right, so I think um, for my mother, it was the same kind of thing. You, she had more freedom in the novel. She could imagine things. She didn't have to stick to the truth. Um, so I, I think I can see many reasons why writing fiction as opposed to writing an autobiography um, had an advantage for her. It's so fascinating. Um, um, so, I spoke earlier about the teacher and uh, the high school, uh, uh, and and some of this is obviously based on on her life, just what you've just said. But her her education ended with high school. I think she 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 never had a chance as, uh, after what would have been university for her ended up being the ghetto. Um, but she had an amazing erudition, and it 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 just plays on every page of 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 this book, and so, and I think she she had a tremendous intellectual curiosity as well. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about where this deep culture of hers came from? How how did she acquire this level of erudition that shines from every page? Um. I think, first of all, she actually, it's true that her education ended at the end of high school because um, 
be, because uh, the, the war intervened. But she did go to a teacher's, a Jewish teacher's seminary in Montreal, where she learned Hebrew. And she was very uh, well versed in, um, in Jewish um, in mysticism and especially folk belief, which she loved. And she had all kinds of books um, that dealt with Jewish myths from, from Eastern Europe, most of them in Yiddish, I might add. Um, for the rest, she, she had a, a great curiosity. She was pretty much, she read all the time. She loved to read biographies of writers and especially women writers. Um, and uh, she read constantly. So I, I think to that extent, she was, um, she was self-educated and, um, and we talk, she and I, we talked literature all the time. So uh, when I started going to McGill, you know, then, then we talked about the sort of things I was writing about, which most mostly Victorian literature. And I got her to read Dickens and, in English and, and Jane Austen and so on. And um, she was also very well versed in the European writers, Polish writers, um, Russian writers. Uh, and so I think most of it, is, she came to her by itself in the sense that she never uh, formally studied. She ended up with, a, uh, with an honorary doctorate, I believe, in the end. She did, yes, in that, at the University of Lethbridge. Yeah, that was, that was really was, nice, yeah. Yeah, she was, she, was very, she was very proud of it. She was very, yeah, she very proud of it, yeah. I, th um, I think it mattered to her that she never went to university. I think she very much regretted it. Literature, as you've just been, um, you know, illustrating, literature was, I think, something like sacred to 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 Hava, and the role of translation was key in her mind um, to learning from the wisdom of of literature. Um, I'm going to quote uh, from one of the essays in this book on the subject of translation. Um, this is Hava. I'm so grateful to translators, to all translators for making the literature, literature of the world available to me and to all the peoples of the world, no matter what language they speak, because I do still believe that literature is the primary way in which we may come to understand one another. She went on to say that this was especially so when it came to Yiddish. Uh, could you read the next passage that follows from this, Goldie? Okay, that's, that's one on page 189. That's right. So she wrote, when translators sit down to their work, they are engaged in more than mere transposing of thoughts and phrases from one language into another. Sometimes, as in the case of Yiddish, there is much more at stake. It is not merely that translation allows literary works to exist in languages in which they never existed before but also that translators are engaged in snatching from the jaws of oblivion that which is in danger of disappearing. It is a most honorable calling. It is a preservation of the past in the present. It's so eloquent, isn't it? So how, how conscious, when you're, when you're translating her, how conscious are you of this role of snatching treasures from the jaws of oblivion? I'm not sure I'm conscious of snatching treasures. I'm, I'm more conscious of snatching my mother from the jaws of oblivion. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's really my mother who I want to, I want people to read. So um, I don't translate widely from Yiddish literature. The only other translations I've done was for the stories from I.L. Peretz, whom I love. Um, but uh, mostly I translate my mother and um, I, I, largely because I don't want, I don't want her to be forgotten. I don't want all this work. I mean, she was writing my entire life practically, right? I, I don't want all of that to sort of slip into oblivion. Um, I, it, it matters to me that people read her and that people realize that she was a great writer. And, and I think, she, she um, part of the problem has been not just that she was a Yiddish writer, but also quite frankly, I think that she was a woman. And especially when she was trying to get her work published in English at first, 
it, it was she got rejection after rejection, especially with the Tree of Life. Um, and but even uh, one of the essays uh, in in this book, what gave me the idea for a book of essays was uh, there's one essay in the book about Simcha Bunim Shaevich, who was the poet of the Lodge Ghetto. And I, I didn't know until really quite recently why he mattered so much to her, but um, she translated that essay herself. She got me to edit it for her and she sent it, she sent out queries to every publication she could think of, English, Canadian, Jewish, nobody was interested. And, and I think partly because it's a very long essay, so it doesn't really fit easily into magazine format, but, but also I think because who, who had ever heard of Shaevich? Who had ever heard of my mother, right? It, it, they, they were just, um, she, she, she got constant sort of shrugs and um, if she got an answer at all. Uh, she got one answer from Saturday Night, the Canadian journal that was really quite um, upsetting. So after her death, uh, so nothing happened with that essay, it just lay among her papers. But after her death, I, I found it and I read it and I thought, you know, this is really very good. It really, really needs to be published. And so I was friendly with David Bezmozgis in Toronto and I asked him to read it and tell me if I was being biased in favor of my mother or if I was right. And he, he got very excited and he's the one who um, basically helped to place the uh, essay with Tablet. And Tablet, I must say, have been very wonderful. And that was really the beginning of the second phase, if I can put it that way, of her career in English. Um, and it's also the, the reason that it, it, it's what planted the seed in my head of collecting her other essays into English. The, the, the one thing I regret is that she was dead by then. She, she has never, um, uh, this sort of resurgence of interest in her work now, she, know, she never knew anything about it. As far as she knew, um, by the time she died, um, she, she was uh, not much read. Tell us about why he was so important and his, his story, I, it, it can't really be summarized, but try. Summer his story. Oh, he, was, um, he was a lot older. Uh, she met him in the ghetto um, at, uh, at, at a, she, she was a young girl and she, and she always was writing poetry. And she went to um, one of the ghetto workshops and um, to read her poems to the uh, person who ran the workshop it was a man called Rabiner. And um, one day Shaevich was there and he listened to her reading and I guess she made an impression on him. So uh, they, that was how they started. What turned out to be, um, which I must say, I didn't realize quite an intense relationship. So she called him always her mentor the person who basically taught her um, about writing. He, was, uh, he wrote poetry constantly in the ghetto. Um, and, uh, and my mother talked about him. I remember all my life that she mentioned him. But what I didn't know until I, I read um, some of her letters to her best friend in Sweden, uh, which I had to, had to get translated, was that she felt terribly guilty about him because when they were sent out um, from the ghetto on their way to Auschwitz and they were in the, uh, the cattle car, he was lying next to her and she ignored him. Uh, she didn't want to say anything to him. She was busy petting my father and trying to get to console my father. And um, of course, as soon as they arrived at Auschwitz, uh, the men were separated from the women and she learned after the war that he had died, that he had gone to um, the gas chamber really almost on the eve of the liberation. So I think in this letter to her friend, she writes about how guilty she feels that she couldn't even spare a kind word. 
for this man who loved her, because that was the other thing that I learned. He was actually very much in love with her. Uh, what she felt for him, I, I've never been 100% sure. Certainly she, she respected him and she cared about him, there's no doubt. But if she returned, she was, uh, she and my father were already um, dating, as we say. And uh, if she returned the kind of passionate love he had for her, I'm not sure. But, but certainly she felt very guilty about him. And I think that's why um, she was so anxious to get, if any of her essays were gonna be translated into English and read, she wanted it to be this one about Shaevich, was, which was a tribute, uh, which she intended as a tribute to him. Because again, who's heard of him? Right? He's, he, he left two poems, that's all, on, um, that were found after the war in a garbage heap. And, and that's it, to the extent that he's known today, that's what he's it's known. It's so for. tragic. It's so tragic. And yet, and yet, and yet, he, and yet, uh, he's a character, he's also one of the major characters in the Tree of Life. Yes, that's true. And, and I think it's a sign you know, of how much, how much he meant to her. The Tree of Life, you know, um, it took her years to write, 20 years by some counting. It was the time when you and your brother were young, and she, to me, at least once expressed the, the, the feeling that she might have been ne neglecting you because at, at the, you, that you were at the, the cost of writing she had to write. She 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 was living this parallel. She was she, she was having a hard hard time living her life in Montreal as a as a new mother as a new immigrant while she was reliving all the events of of uh, all the horrors and also all the uplifting moments of of the ghetto. Do you remember like Do you remember what it was like to have this intense writing going on while you were growing up? I hated it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I wanted my mother to pay attention to me. And uh, when she was so busy writing all the time, um, she didn't pay attention to me. Uh, one time I got angry enough that I, uh, I took one, she wrote by hand in uh, Eaton's notebooks. And I, I took one of them and I threw it down the um, incinerator. And uh, this... <laughs> I, you know, I, I was so angry. I said, why don't you pay attention to me? And she went like a bat. <laughs> she went running down. We were on the third floor of a walk up. She went running down and uh, luckily retrieved the notebook. It hadn't been burned yet. And uh, she, she was so angry, she couldn't talk to me. <laughs> and I realized I'd done something really very bad and I never did it again. But I, I resented the fact that I wanted her attention. And then as I got older, you know, it became a fact of life that she was always writing. Um, and so I, I minded it less as I got older. Um, so it, it and obviously we, we would talk. Um, it, it, uh, it, it became sort of part of the furniture in an odd way. I know my friends remember, um, that we, we were always supposed to shush because she was writing. But she also used us as material. You know, like I would come home and have, uh, she would feed me, I would come home from school and I'd blab on about the doings of my school and the schoolmates and this one said that and that one said this. And suddenly she would jump up if I said something and run to her workroom and write it down. And then she'd come back and she'd say, yeah, go on. You know, so it was, um, in a sense, I guess, even then we were collaborating, although I didn't know it at the time. You know, um, it really, um, it's really, really interesting to hear you say these, these things, uh, because one doesn't really know one's parents until one is really quite a bit older. Um, you also, like, uh, you know, had the urge to throw this away, but you also said that your father disparaged her work so that you had not one, but two famous parents, uh, Goldie. What was it like for you and your brother 
with these two big characters, these two big personalities? Oh, I wouldn't presume to talk uh, from my, about my brother. My brother had his own relationship and his own thoughts, and I wouldn't like him to speculate on what I thought, and I don't want to speculate on what he thinks. Uh, for me, uh, my, my parents did not have a good marriage. They were constantly uh, arguing over various things, such as Jewishness. Um, such as, uh, where, are we going to send the children to Jewish school or not? And so uh, I got sent to the Jewish school. I'm older. And my, my father decided that his son, God forbid, his son should go to a Jewish school and didn't send him to that school, which means that to this day, my brother does not know Yiddish. Um, so, and personally, I think it's a loss. Uh, I, 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 I don't know, I'm, I, my father, um, he did, he did, uh, the thing I find hard to forgive him is that he denigrated my mother all the time. And part of the problem was that he, um, he wanted to forget what, I mean, they both went through the Holocaust. He wanted to forget what had happened. He was always going forward, right? We're not supposed to, to dwell on the past. We are only going ahead. Um, at, whereas my mother, of course, was constantly recalling the past. She was writing about it. So um, to that extent, they, they didn't have, um, they didn't agree on, on how to deal with the trauma of the Holocaust. And in my mother's stories, there are many, especially the stories, if you look, if you read the marriages in those stories, uh, those are pretty much pictures of my mother and father's marriage, um, and where where the woman is uh, thinking always of the past, and the the man is disparaging her. For the the famous story, Edge's Revenge, right, has a a couple uh, where the the husband is always saying, "Well, my wife lives in the past." Well, that that's what my father said. And so he, he disparaged her in that way. And he also um, never let her forget that he was the one who was, had given money for publication, for instance, of the Bird of the Ghetto. And uh, later, I think he may have given money also for the publication of uh, the Tree of Life because Yiddish publishers were always asking for extra funds, right? You needed to raise funds. So, and as my father became more prosperous, he had more money, but it was, you know, um, well, I, I had the impression when I was young that my mother was, excuse me, it was one of these women, you know, she was, um, she just scribbled because she had nothing else to do with her life. And I, as I said, I didn't change my mind and realize just how uh, impressive a writer she was until I was in my mid thirties. Uh, by which time my parents had divorced. But it was not, um, you know, I, I think it left an impression and an unfortunate impression of, of, um, of what she was doing and the fact that it didn't matter somehow, that it was, um, it, it was, you know, a, a woman passing the time, housewife passing the time because she has nothing better to do. Um, I, I definitely got that impression from my, my father's attitude. Well, this book and your other work, bringing, bringing Hava's work to the world, should put a stop to any ideas of that kind, Goldie. And I want to congratulate you again on this really fine achievement and, uh, and urge our readers, our, our audience, to buy this book, to read other books um, by Hava Rosenfarb, who is a wonderful, wonderful writer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank Elaine kalman naves and Goldie Morgenthaler for this really extraordinary and engaging conversation and evening. This event, which was originally supposed to have taken place on May 5th, 2020. And of course, as our world was changing, we had to postpone. But I and, uh, and I know everyone speaking for all who, who were privileged to listen to this, uh, to this conversation are grateful that almost one year later it did take place and we were able to have, uh, to have this program. It was very special, not only hearing 
from a scholar and translator, but from a daughter performing these roles for, for her mother. And in terms of the parent-child relationship, I could only think about the power with which Chava herself wrote about her longing for her own parents in, for example, in the Bergen-Belsen Diaries, which, which Goldie translated about the moment uh, that she learned of her father's death, of that difficult moment, about her dreams, which were so vividly inhabited by, by her own parents. And, and, and Elaine quoted that powerful statement that Chava said that Goldie's translations were, were a lifeline for her. And I think we've come to a greater understanding of that concept this evening of seeing the power of one generation to keep the words and the memories of the previous generations alive. Thank you both so much for, for what you've brought to our community this evening. And I also want to, uh, to mention that this session is the conclusion of our spring semester of Tuesday Night Learning at the Shar. And I'd like, on behalf of, of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds who have enjoyed these sessions, I wanna thank the leaders of Tuesday Night Learning at the Shar, Louis Dobrin and Mark Kaplan, for their commitment to this program and to the standards of, of excellence and learning and engagement that has made uh, Tuesday Night Learning such a, such a successful endeavor. Our gratitude to Robin Bennett for her hard work on this program and so much at the Shar, to Susan Greenspoon, and most of all, thank all of you who are tuning in, who are staying connected, who are continuing to look to Shara Shemayim for, uh, for these moments of connection and learning. And stay tuned for information about the fall semester, which will be coming, coming soon. And I thank our guest speakers and thank everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Erev Tov. <laughs>